started. Sherry. All right. Ooh. Wait, wait. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Marky. I'm the curator here at the museum. Um, <laughs> uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about William Willis. So who knows about William? Like, does anyone, has anyone heard of William Willis? Who knew him personally? Okay, I will be louder. <laughs> I can, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so two people, was that two hands that knew him? Okay, so no pressure from me. Great. Um, <laughs> so for those who may not have known, uh, Mulis was a world-renowned artist for over 48 years. He was known for his mural paintings, as well as his oils, watercolors, gouaches, and collages. Most of his work featured flat, vivid colors, and his subject matter was usually inspired by his surroundings traveling the world. Can everyone hear me now? Perfect. Uh, he was born in Chicago on October 7th, 1919, to Frank and Stella Bliss, and had two brothers, George, who preceded him in death, and Frank, who passed away in 2014. The blue image on the screen, which you can't see, because now, of course, it's not working. There we go. Okay, wrong button. So the blue image on the screen is Melissa's present. Um, and then the image on the right is just a photo that I really love of him because <laughs> I just think he looks great. Um, we don't have a date on that. Okay. So Mullis attended the Art Institute of Chicago on September, in September 1937 on scholarship. He achieved honorable mention each of the years he attended. While there, he studied under Margaret Artingstall in the design department and he graduated in 1941. Mullis also studied at the Illinois Institute of Design under renowned German architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Hungarian modernist artist Maholy Nash, Laszlo Maholy Nash, sorry. Van der Rohe is regarded as one of the pioneers of modernist architecture. His most notable structure is the Edith Farnsworth House in Plano. And for van der Rohe, less was more. Maholy Naj was a professor in the Bauhaus School in Germany, which strove to combine aesthetics with everyday function. He was highly influenced by constructivism and a strong advocate of the integration of technology and industry into the arts. His largest accomplishment is the Institute of Design in Chicago. And I just wanted to present them to you so you could see um, where Mullis might have gotten some of his influences. Okay. So in the early 1940s, Mullis was commissioned by Kate Raftery, owner of the Little Traveler in Geneva, to paint murals in various rooms of the business. Former employee Jean Overton Wyatt recalled that Mrs. Raftery wanted someone to come out to design things. She called the Art Institute for assistance and they sent Mullis. She met him for coffee, he stayed for lunch, and then the rest of the day. This early commission flourished into a lifelong friendship and business partnership between the two. From 1947 to 1952, Mullis kept an art studio and home on the second floor of the house. The photographs here show two fitting room doors painted by Mullis. And the picture on the left is from uh, one of the almanacs. And the picture on the right is the doors as they are now, which they are next door in our feature gallery. This photo, it's, it's not very good, but it shows a cut out piece of wood that was also painted by Mullis. It's currently hanging above a window in the shoe department of Little Trap. So Mullis created their high style brand image and marketed the business through his design and authorship of the Little Traveler Almanacs, which are a quarterly promotional booklet mailed to customers around the world. Essentially, Mullis developed a sense of environment for the traveler that in turn would aid the economic development of Geneva's business district. And that you can learn more about in our gallery over there. In addition to his murals for the Traveler and illustrations for the Almanac, Mullis also did decorations for the Junior Women's Club style show in St. Charles and background work for the Traveler's clothing. Image to the right was uh, featured as a cover for the fall 1944 Almanac, and the one on the left is often seen at the end of the Almanacs to show that he is designed. So summer 1942 is the first time William Mullis' artwork appears in the Almanac. 
And there's also a mention of his summer sketch classes for children. So he did much more than just design. And I included this just because I love this image. Um, it's a photo that was in the almanac featuring uh, the widow's walk on the roof, of the little traveler. Um, it was referenced as the captain's walk, awaiting arrival of merchandise. And we believe this is Melissa posing up. So this is a sort of rough mock-up of the fall 1951 almanac that Melissa did. It's dated after the almanac came out. So I'm, I'm thinking that he just used this mock-up to write a letter to Kate. Um, the writing's kind of hard to read. But he does say on the bottom left, why not use the same idea for all future covers, just changing the words? Maybe the next one, peace, joy, love. And then this is the actual 1951 All Met cover. And so his work is featured heavily throughout the Almanacs from 42 on. And as you can see, they did not go with his idea to use that one same cover <laughs> design for every year. Um, they are much different from year to year. If you'd like to see more of them, we have them all on an iPad in the feature gallery, so you can use through them. So before we move away from the traveler for a bit, I also wanted to point out, um, this was a recent donation to the museum from the owner of the Little Traveler, Mike Simon. This bag was used at the Little Traveler in 1983, and it was also designed by us. Okay. So on December 8, 1941, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Mullis enrolled as an Illinois National Guardsman. On October 21, 1942, he entered regular military service with the Army Air Corps at March, River, March Field in Riverside, California. He signed up for five years or until the end of the war, which luckily was only a few years later. <laughs> Upon his completion of basic training, he was listed as a private. He also listed his occupation and civil life as that of a draftsman while living in Geneva, single with no dependents. The Republican article on the screen here from June 1944 indicated that Mullis was stationed at San Bernardino Air Force and had attained the rank of corporal. The other image on the screen is a letter from the Dean of the Art Institute to supplement Mullis's application for enlistment. The Dean states, I have found him intelligent, responsible to teaching, creative and imaginative in his approach to new problems. The article also mentioned that Mullis had done a mural called the History of Flight in the Court of the Operations Building, as well as decorations in the Officers Club and the Red Cross team. So these are just a few of the images. So while in the military, Mullis also created several different war bonds posters. And I don't know if you can see it, but this one says, a war bond is a concrete, tangible promise of a better world to come. Here's another one from bonds to shells to victory. Bonds promise peace. And victory cries out by war bonds. And remember, the Japanese haven't lost a war in 2,000 years. Um, it is unclear whether or not these were actually copied and distributed, or if these were just his own creation of this station. So upon leaving military service in 1945, Mullis returned to Geneva and continued to illustrate for the Little Traveler. He took back residence at the rooftop penthouse of the Little Traveler, this time sharing the space with architect Walter Frazier. Frazier was the business partner and childhood friend of Kate Raftery's son, John Howard Raftery. The photo above was referred to in one of the almanacs, and I couldn't find which one it was again, but it refers to it as Bill's Garden, referring to Mullis. So Mullis no doubt connected with Frazier through their shared work with Kate and the Little Traveler, but also through their shared experience in the Army Air Corps. Both men were stationed at San Bernardino during the war, although I have no images of them together. Uh, the images on screen were both created by Mullis, and the one on the right is a birthday card for Frazier from 1974. Mullis was a big fan of making birthday cards for his friends. Which, I mean, if you're talented like that, might as well. As early as 1948, Mullis received his first major commission when he was awarded $100,000 from Hotel Chicago's Hotel Stevens to redecorate their boulevard room with large murals. It would become famous through the 1950s for being the big, largest hotel ice rink in the country. I didn't even know that was a thing. In addition to the murals, Mullis also redesigned their menu. 
And this commission put Mullis on the map and was the first of many murals he would complete for well-known hotel chains, including the Palmer House, Conrad Hilton and Drake Hotels in Chicago, Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria, Hotel New Yorker, and Statler Hilton Hotel in New York, and the Mandarin Hotel in Hong Kong. So he would often work with Walter Frazier on these larger projects. The above photograph shows Mullis and Frazier seated in front of one of Mullis's murals inside the Gate Peacock, the Netherlands Hilton Hotel's cocktail lounge in 1957. And the image on the right, if you can see it, shows what was actually painting the mural. Lewis also designed the menu for the lounge. And there was a sandwich called the Paul Bunyan sandwich. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, what was his name? Jim Kaiser. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. That's great. Oh, just Oh. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's great. Well, this one is of Melissa and Frazier and your parents in 1957 in front of another Moulis mural after completing work at the Terrace Hilton Casba Lounge in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I wish these photos were in color because I'd love to see this palette. And so this is the menu uh, for the Casba Lounge. And you'll see why later Moulis was inspired to give this lounge a Moroccan. So besides his public artwork, many of Moulis's private paintings were adaptations of his travels in foreign countries. His oils and gouaches often incorporated collage by painting over native handwoven materials or paper. The rich and famous, such as Helen Hayes and Greer Garson, purchased Moulis's paintings for their personal collections. While Chicago's elite, including Brooks McCormick, Kimball Salisbury, Elliot Donnelly, and John T. Peary Jr., commissioned him to decorate their homes with mural works. Moulis had over 20 one man shows all over the world, including Paris and Bangkok, as well as the government pavilion in Morocco and the U.S. Embassy in Manila. For seven years, he served as resident artist for the Moroccan Sharifian Empire through the French Department de Beaux Arts in Rabat invited on at the request of the Moroccan government, which provided him a villa and expenses. Not a bad deal. After his travels, Moulis would often curate his shows with his artwork to highlight the different cultures he explored. And this is him in front of one of his paintings of Damascus. His work was displayed in Chicago's exclusive art galleries and fulfilled a special role in the cultural life of the city, often winning praise for his colorful and vibrant works. These are just some of the write-ups. I mean, we have so many articles. He was constantly in the newspapers in Chicago and here. One such show took place in July 1953 when Moulis held an exhibition of paintings at the John Fordham Gallery in Aurora. That's the invitation. The paintings were created while he was in Morocco. The exhibit in, Moro in Aurora was called Moroccan Moods, and at its opening, posts were dressed in Moroccan attire. We definitely love the theme. Would have been great at parties. Moulis's versatile creativity consisted of bold, contrasting colors with semi-abstract with a semi-abstract method of painting that was sought after by large, successful businesses. For the Chicago Men's Club, he created a 40 by 26 foot mural of the Chicago skyline, and locally, the Merchants National Bank in Aurora commissioned him to paint a 16 by 16 foot mural titled "City of Lights." This depicted the city's history. And the clipping on the right there shows mural, uh, shows Moulis working on the mural. There's too many M's. And this is a front shot of the mural. I don't have a color photograph, unfortunately, um, and you can kind of hard to see. Um, but we do know that it included the McCormick Reaper, the first Burlington train to arrive in Aurora, different characters in costume and lettering from old editions of the Aurora Beacon News, 
Um, and the buildings shown in the mural were the Coulter Opera House, Fitch House, Empire House, and several shops along Broadway, all in a turn of the century style, which Mullis researched at the historic Aurora Historical Society prior to painting to ensure the historical accuracy of the depictions. Mullis's artistic style also became desirable for publicity and decor by elite organizations such as the Art Institute, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Lincoln Park Zoo, Lyric Opera, and the Shakespeare Festival at Ravinia. In 1953, Mullis and Frazier moved into Frazier's newly finished home at 102 South Bennett. The pair were actually neighbors with Frazier's business partner, Howard Raftery, and his family, who lived at 120 South Bennett. And these are a few pictures of the exterior and interior. I included these because it's always nice to see how artists decorate their own homes. Again, I wish most of these were in color. And then this is an image of Walter Frazier relaxing in his house with his dog in 1968. And I included this because it's a little bit of color. And then I included this one just because I think Frazier looks neat. Um, this is him and his dog again, uh, but in their backyard. So this is a mural Moose painted in 1956 in West Roxbury, Massachusetts. I included it because it seemed somewhat reminiscent of early Japanese paintings, um, which used a blown off roof technique to sort of give an bird's eye view of a scene. Um, the mural was directly painted on a canvas attached to a wall and included gold leaf at the top, which I'm a sucker for gold leaf paintings. So. In, in the 1950s and 60s, Ray Castro and Edison Dick opened over 15 upscale cafes and restaurants that were among Chicago's most highly rated eateries. They chose Mullis as their primary designer for over seven of the restaurants. Clipping above shows Mullis's mural of the French Riviera at Le Puisset. And again, Mullis not only incorporated the murals, but also designed and developed the restaurant's marketing style and menu design. And this was neat that I found. In 1960, Mullis and Fraser collaborated on Le Petit Cafe in Chicago. And the letter above is from a representative of an interior of interior design magazine based in New York. It shows how much their work compressed even those in their own field years after a project was complete. The letter reads, the interior design work you did here is so attractive regardless of the time that has passed. And he's asking permission to include photographs of it in the magazine. And this is dated. 64. And so I don't blame him because the cafe was gorgeous. So these are just a few pictures of the cafe. Where is the cafe? This is in Chicago. I don't have an exact location. So in February 1966, the United States Embassy in Manila exhibited several of William Mullis's paintings. The paintings depicted the spirit and life of Thailand, Japan, Hong Kong, and the Philippines that Mullis was able to experience during, during his journeys to East and Southeast Asia. Clipping above shows Mullis and the U.S. Ambassador's wife planning the exhibition layout. And I just love how cool they look. They just, he's got his shades on and they're just so focused. I don't know. So during one of his travels to Thailand, Mullis stayed with American businessman Jim Thompson, and Thompson is credited with revitalizing the Thai silk industry, which had all but collapsed. According to one of Mullis's draft press releases, while staying with Thompson, Mullis created several jungle-inspired design, jungle designs for silks, which had been ordered by Queen Siriket of Thailand for anniversary gowns that would be created by Pierre Balmain. And if you don't know, Balmain is one of the biggest fashion houses in the world. According to Thompson's website, the partnership between himself and Sirikit started in 1959, with the Queen wearing his Thai silks while on a visit to the U.S. Sirikit and her husband, King Bumabal, visited the U.S. twice, one in 1960, once in 1960, and once in 1967. So it's possible that the Queen could have worn a Mullis designed silk when visiting. It's possible. Um, so the image is there. One on the left is Queen Sirikit and Jim Thompson. And the one on the right is Queen Sarah Kitt uh, during her second visit to the United States. I just thought that was really cool. 
Also, interesting fact about Jim Thompson, he used to work for the CIA and ended up going missing in 1967 in Malaysia while on holiday, and they never found him. So there's a big conspiracy that it was a CIA hit, or it was just he was attacked by locals, um, which I find a little bit demeaning to the locals because if they were, it was Malaysia, you know, or he retired and escaped. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. So, so from time to time, Willis would work in collaboration with the legendary uh, designer, William Palman. Palman started his career at, as head of interior design at Lord & Taylor before opening Palman & Associates, a New York-based design firm in 1946. The above article from 1967 looks at a house that Mullis assisted Palman with. And the article reads, over the beds are hung a pair of Persian panels by William Mullis. Unfortunately, that's not in the picture though, and I couldn't find it. But from 1972 to 1975, Mullis assisted Palman and Associates on four major projects for Texas A&M University during the renovation of its student center and Rudder Tower buildings. Mullis did the drawings pictured on the screen that were used as cartoons for a series of etched glass windows in the student center depicting the flowers of Texas. And I love this letter because it's dear Bill, best Bill, um, but we obviously know it's the list because it's on his letterhead and his handwriting and his address. <laughs> so after renovations to the Memorial Student Center were complete, many students objected to the new decorating scheme, finding the furnishings too extravagant and inappropriate for the purpose of a student center. A 1975 questionnaire issued by the campus newspaper found that 92% of respondents disliked the new furnishings, finding the space stiff, formal, and unfriendly. It was to be the firm's final project, and following its completion, William Palmer retired. And that's just to show you can do beautiful work and still have. Um, and I don't, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I don't see how that could be seen as stiff. But again, he only worked on part of it. With Palmer. So in 1977, Willis designed a holiday card for the Lincoln Park Zoological Society. This was not his first interaction with the zoo. He previously worked on, with them on decor and artworks for various events, including one event where he had designed what was described as like a wire lion. And I really wish there was a photo. I tried to find one and I didn't. Um, so if anyone's seen it, <laughs> let me know. It sounded really cool. Um, but this card was in collaboration between Willis and Ray Dove. And Willis's designs, designs seem to work well for note cards and holiday cards. Um, the above card features another mural by Mullis for a chapel at the Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And then a Chris, this is a Christmas card for St. Joseph Hospital. And like the zoo card, this is another collaboration with Ray Duck. And this angel is also featured in one of the Little Traveler's holiday almanacs. And here's another holiday postcard designed by Mullis. And this was just cute. It's just a little homemade card by Mullis. I don't know if he was just practicing or if it was actually a card to someone. I just me. And so this is another exhibition Mullis did as a result of his travels throughout Asia. And anyone familiar with the almanacs will recognize the tiger. And that is the sole reason I included it is because the tiger is just so iconic for Mullis that so Willis also designed invitations for the Lincoln Park Zoo, such as the ones above. And if there's one thing Willis loved, it was color. And he used it very well. So the 1980s saw Willis slowing down a bit, working with more local organizations. Uh, the photos on here show Willis next to a poster he designed for the Fox Valley Artist Series, showcasing local artists and their works. And the photo on the right shows the front of the brochure for the artist series. So not too different from each other. So Mullis also continued his work with the Little Traveler. Pictures on the screen show a tree with different angels Mullis created and a rough sketch of the design idea. And we actually have one of the angels in our collection. And so on her, it says 1848 house, which was an antique house in Geneva, in Geneva, I believe. Uh, so I'm not sure if the angels were just decoration or if 
and promoting local businesses because this is the only one we have and you can't really see in the other picture. So they're pretty. So in 1986, Melissa was called back to the traveler to paint murals in its new grand pavilion room, which was now enclosed. Melissa designed the gazebo in the center and painted the pineapples on the ceiling. And he actually painted those. He was about 67 at the time. He painted those on his back on a staff, which if you've been in Little Traveler, you see they're kind of, you know, they're pretty all over the ceiling. Um, and I loved the sketch because it's pink and the gazebo is pink. And so this is one of the pineapples that's on the ceiling. They are still up there and the gazebo is still up. And so I had to include this. So at one point during his life, Mullis began writing and illustrating the beast loop. The book features various animals eating at a banquet. And I'll read it to you because it's cute. How dainty, how sweet, said a walrus to his mate while he munched a fig and she ate a date. Uh, it highlights Melissa's lean towards Art Nouveau and his drawings. A fox eating grapes is happiest when it's sucking sweet juices and spitting out pits. I don't know if the rhyme really works for that one. That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll excuse me for that. Um, he also practiced his French, which he no doubt learned in Rabat. So this translates to Master Raven perched on a tree while holding cheese coveted by the quick red fox. Too bad. El Dimanche. <laughs> I mean, I could try too, but I would butcher it. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, the book was never published, and we're unclear of when Mulish, Mulis initially wrote it. But this is the last page. The banquet is over; it's growing dark, and nothing is left but the song of the. I really wish it was published. I'd buy everything. <laughs> so, although Mulis provided many different contributions to the arts. We have found that his unique mural work is becoming a rarity. Due to the permanent nature of murals, they are often neglected or go out of fashion, and they're frequently painted over or destroyed. Sadly, many of Melissa's murals, like the one at the National Bank in Aurora, have suffered a similar fate. So however, some of his murals are well-preserved, as is the case of 100 East Bellevue in Chicago, where they cover the elevator walls and lobby. The management and tenants of this high-rise condominium hold its high artwork in high regard. Here's a little close-up. It's just so gorgeous. Although the condominium's design style has changed since the murals were completed in 1971, they feel a responsibility to care for them and appreciate the merit of this accomplished artist. And oftentimes, Mullis didn't sign his murals, so it's also hard to really you know, appreciate a mural if it's not signed, you're just like, oh, it's just a random mural. So another uh, place where one of Melissa's murals still resides is Edgewater Beach Cafe, located on Sheridan Road in Chicago. One of the reviews for the cafe on Google actually points out that all of the walls are bare, save for one lively mural, which I thought was cute. I wanted to reply, I'm like, hey, that's a really cool one. I'll go back to him and his mom in a second. Oh gosh. So Melissa's work has continued to be featured throughout the Little Traveler even after his death. The Traveler's infamous blue sign outside was originally designed and painted by Melissa, and the current owner, Mike Simon, enjoyed it so much, he's had two different artists since remake the sign in Melissa's original style. The image on the left uh, is not the original, but was created by Brian Hazelton in the early 2000s. And it was donated to us in 2016 when it was replaced uh, by the one on the right, uh, by Nancy Mil Milsky, I apologize, uh, who remade the sign for Little Traveler in 2016. Melissa's art has also been featured on shopping bags throughout the years of the Traveler, such as the ones shown above. And uh, you'll still find uh, images of his in the almanacs. They still use his designs all throughout. I have to like skip. So we're fortunate that William Mullis chose the Fox Valley area as the center from which to spread his unique international flair while inspiring cultural, di cultural diversity in the place he called home. Even after moving out of the Little Traveler, he continued living in Geneva until he died 
on January 6, 1989. And the picture here, it's really cute. It's of Mullis and his mother in 1973. And the background, the statue in the background, it was actually a gift from Jim Thompson. And if anyone knows if that statue is still in existence, please let me know. Um, it's Burmese. So. The Geneva History Museum nominated William Mullis to be included in the Fox Valley Arts Hall of Fame and he was inducted in 2018. His work is honored with a bronze plaque at the Paramount Arts Center in Geneva. And we are certainly lucky Mullis decided to call Geneva home. That's it. But also, if you enjoy Mullis's works, shameless promotion, we sell merchandise with his designs on it. We have note cards. We have mugs with the little animals. Yeah. We have posters with the little animals, different designs of animals. And of course, we have our beautiful little travel. Please take a look in our gift shop. And that is it. Oh, yes. And for those of you who are here, sorry to the guys at home, um, we have three Um, and one of his names. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah any questions? Yeah, yeah sure. Yes. And I used to, we did it during COVID. So it's, it, uh, I think it's called If These Walls Could Talk. And so we had asked Mike Simon, and we, have, we also did the Hotel Geneva. We were trying to entertain people when we couldn't be open, show them things that you can't see. And we, so he let us show everything. Went upstairs, and there's two upstairs. There's the upstairs when you first walk in, and there's the upstairs above the carriage house. They don't connect. So it's uncertain sometimes to know which was used for living space. But primarily, well, now above the carriage house are offices, and there's also offices in the lunchroom up above first the front stairs. But I would believe that Mulas would have lived in the above the carriage house. That to me, that's more of a homey. There was a, a bathroom up there that you could tell, and a fireplace. It just seems more cozy like that. That would be living quarters, but it's kind of uncertain. But check it out on YouTube. No, but there's the original wallpaper still on the right outside Betsy's office. So if you were to go up those stairs, but you can't when they're open, but maybe we'll do another behind the scenes fall or something. We sold out both of them, but we didn't go we upstairs. Did go upstairs. So, That's true, because it's too hard to get 30 people. And there's no way down, like you have to come yeah. back down again. So, but if you if you were to get the time and maybe you could go up the stairs <laughs> and take the right, the original wallpaper is up there. It's I have snuck up there a couple of times. I have snuck customers up, okay, <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> Are you planning to ever wish me about it? More downstairs, 
Given to Kate's great granddaughter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the mayor's doing a proclamation at 11 on the front porch at the traveler, and then just on a key in the city to Kate wraps remove Kate's great granddaughter, and then Mike will also get a uh, plaque. Yeah, it's all in the almanac. Just gave you one. A <laughs> story. <laughs> and if they do, maybe they can use the microphone. Yeah. So we're hearing the crowd on. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I actually have a couple of stories. <clears throat> I mean, one uh, Bill was a good friend. So grandmother invited Bill, myself, and some other people. We went to um, Chicago Golf Tour um, for Thanksgiving dinner. And there's a bar downstairs there that is for men only. Well, I was told that there was a picture of my grandfather down there, um, I guess going like this. So I had never seen the picture and I wasn't allowed to go down there. So Bill said, well, I'll take you down there. So <laughs> Bill and I went down, you know, went downstairs and I got to see the picture of my grandfather, which was really great. So and that was actually the last time I was at Chicago Golf was with them. Um, and then for my graduation, when I graduated from college, I really wanted a Moolah's painting. So I told my mother that's what I wanted. And so I don't know if my grandmother or my mother um, called him. And so we went over to his house and I got to walk around and look at all the paintings on the wall, which was really fun. And I selected two paintings, which I still have today. I love them. And then Bill had a cat. So his cat greeted us when we walked in. And I had cats. Well, I lived in Chicago. Um, in a high rise, and my cat fell out the window, which was terrible. So um, it was really traumatic. But Bill, so Bill heard about it, and he wrote the nicest note, nicest note. So I still have that. So he was so fun. I I just really enjoyed being with him, and I I love his artwork. Yeah. So. Can I ask your name? Uh, Jean Fauntleroy. Oh sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I noticed too, so I used to live at 21 West Gerda, and I used to take out from Lake Rosette that was downstairs, and I didn't realize that those murals in there were his. So that was really great to see that. Thank you. Love a scan of that. If you want to give it up, you can bring it in. We can scan it if you're okay. willing to share that. That shows okay. another side of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 